session today is about melatonin and what we think is fundamental. Just a little bit of a background. Uh, the company was founded originally in order to develop uh, products for gastric bypass patients and rectal suppositories was our last choice. So it wasn't our first choice. It wasn't anything. We had real problems with the compounding pharmacists. Injections were going to be a problem because patients were really non-compliant. And subsequent to that, we just decided that we were going to, uh, we were using sublingual trochies, and they were patently horribly tasty, and nobody really was going to hold them underneath their tongue, and the variance was so wide because of the different molecular sizes, and the taste would be horrific, and it was horrific that even I wouldn't take them. <laughs> Believe in that, uh, melatonin is both a rectal suppository and with a sustained release mechanism, highly comfortable, imperceptible as far as feeling them, uh, no defecation reflex, no irritation, and so far, uh, to my knowledge, personal knowledge of taking a lot of them, and I mean a lot of them, uh, I would say no irritation to the rectum, just the opposite. Hemorrhoids disappeared because of the antioxidants. The therapies that we're looking to affect which is basically oxidative stress and pre-ratin pathologies, is requires one milligram per kilogram delivered into the bloodstream. Now, this is where the conversation gets interesting. Melatonin cannot be absorbed in any demonstrably consistent manner by the human body, period. First off, if we want to talk about first liver metabolism or biotransformation, whatever word you want to use, once you orally ingest melatonin, the variance in individuals is from 1% absorption to 56% absorption, making it orally a not a feasible drug if you want to have consistent and demonstrable therapeutic effects in the patient population. So that's the first thing that was the big issue. You have to bypass the liver. Now I had an interesting vehicle in rectal suppositories and the other thing was to maintain a therapeutic dosage over time. Now, again, and I'm trying to keep this in a continuum. What makes melatonin so profoundly effective is that it permeates every single cell structure within every single species known to mankind or the current universe. The only product in the entire world that stops absolute free radical formation created by the energy produced necessary to sustain life is melatonin, period. So all neurodegenerative diseases, all strokes, all heart attacks, all cerebrovascular dementias, everything fundamental to aging is predicated on oxidative stress, free radical destruction of the mitochondria, and how many free radicals. Dr. Patterson and I sat down one day when I first met, I think about the second time we met, right, Ron? We sat down and I brought two articles and we went page by page, line by line, each article, right? And his comment was, wow, okay. So Dr. Patterson decided to, that we would use colocalciferol to utilize uh, the vitamin D aspect and what we would do is combine it with melatonin and there would be a topical, ap topical application which was selling phenomenal price I think in the Bahamas here and you put it on your breasts. Now interestingly enough, when I was going back to refute the argument by writer that you could take oral melatonin to avoid radiation damage, which by the way is the only thing that prevents radiation damage. Brownstein and all these clowns that think it's cancer, the thyroid is a joke, and potassium iodide, that's the biggest joke. You know what radiation poisoning is? It's, uh, it's fibromyalgia on steroids. <laughs> and, that, and it's a hydroxy radical, which is the most uh, powerful free radical and there's a buildup in the tissue, and the only way you can get it out is with chelation, which is an interesting concept because I have the only chelators. It is commonly accepted that melatonin, unfortunately I don't have the reference here, but I have it in, in my computer, is the melatonin, the most relevant pineal secretory product, has oncostatic properties in a wide variety of tumors, especially in those identified as being hormonally dependent. Does anybody know how many hormonally dependent tumors there are? Like almost all of them. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. From skin cancer, from melanomas, squamous cell carcinomas, to everything that Ron's ever seen, right? Well, melatonin is actually secreted 
throughout the entire body and all secretory modes and every single cell tissue to some degree, primarily in the pineal gland. To this day, there's this misinformation that's constantly perpetuated that it's in the pineal gland. It exists all through the body and Dr. You know, Dr. Gay's not in his head, right? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. It's sort of like um, other things. Iodine is another story of it's throughout the entire body, but primarily in the thyroid. Due to the wide spectrum of melatonin's actions, the mechanisms that may be involved in this ability to counteract tumor growth are varied. These include an antioxidant effect, regulation of the estrogen receptor expression and transactivation. By the way, the only uh, compound ever discovered that actually works both as an enzyme inhibitor as well as a, uh, uh, a uh, the enz enzymatic inhibition is rather the actual inhibition and secretion of uh, estrogen. Modulation of the enzymes involved in local synthesis of estrogens. Uh, modulation of cell cycle induction of apoptosis. Anybody knows what that is? I do. Cell death. Inhibition of telomere telomerase activity. Well, Jesus, we like telomerase activity. All the old people like that. Mm -hmm. Inhibition of metastasis. Prevention of circadian uh, disruption. There's a whole theory that people who work at night have a higher incidence of cancer and it's a circadian disruption. Anti-angiogenesis, which means it inhibits the proliferation of the vasculature and uh, it, that's how cancer spread. Epigenetic effects. Got, can't you got to get, if you can knock out some genetic effects, stimulation of cell differentiation, activation of the immune system. Other than those 11 things, it doesn't work worth a damn. The data supporting each of these oncostatic actions of melatonin are summarized in this review. Moreover, the list of actions described may not be exhaustive in terms of how melatonin modulates tumor growth. So we've had a very good effect with this, and it's very effective for tumor growth at exceptionally high dosages. So. People ask me, have you ever made a 500 milligram suppository? And have you ever taken 3,000 milligrams of melatonin? Yeah, I have. So it's very, very powerful antistatic. The other thing is it's a remarkably effective antioxidant. How many people understand that most free radical scavengers are on a 1 to 1 ratio of molecules? Melatonin is on a 10 to 1 ratio. And interestingly, each generation, when it's called a suicidal, uh, free radical scavenger and then when it latches onto a free radical it causes the free radical the form of free radical this new uh, metabolite to be the metabolite is something that's formed in consequence of a chemical reaction in the body those who don't know that uh, it says it forms an antioxidant cascade of four generations one of the most effective free radical scavengers oh, you could ever take would you clarify for the benefit of the audience that what you're referring to is not just melatonin, but the end product, the metabolic product. Right. These are metabolites, and, and, and he's uh, right. Not only melatonin, but melatonin undergo undergoes a change in the body when it attaches to free radicals. And in, in fact, those free radicals now are good guys. Mm -hmm. So I like to say they've been converted. Now, melatonin is a profound anti-inflammatory, and I am going to never Dr. Patterson has had some f profound effects. He was the one who inf told me that for uh, vaginal dryness, as women got older, DHEA would be a much, our DHA, micronized DHA product would be effective. Now it was more, for, it was more acidic, and I've reformulated the product so that it's now more alkaline, so it's not as irritating. But as far as the ability to localize, elevate estrogen and hormonal levels, in the localized vaginal tissue, it's phenomenal because it doesn't expose the patient to the systemic elevation of estrogen, but it does allow for the uh, the vaginal walls to actually uh, become moist again as a result of the hormonal de defect. So you get you get the win on both levels. You get localized increase of the estrogens, and yet and the hormones necessary to maintain uh, uh, vaginal viscosity. That's an interesting <laughs> alliteration, right? Vaginal viscosity. Or... Uh, That's a good word. Yeah, I know. It's, it's sort of very official sounding, isn't it? <laughs> and at the other point, you're not getting a systemic elevation of estrogen, which if you're any female physicians are seeing patients, this whole concept of giving patients in this environment is one for some concerns, given the fact of the BRCA1, BRCA2 genetic defect. So 
hormonally mediated hormones in this population. By the way, the, the I don't any physicians know. I don't know. Not everybody's a physician here who sees this stuff, but the incidence of cancer is upwards of 22 percent of this genetic defect in the female population of the Bahamas, and that's why all these breast cancer uh, research facilities are here. They have ample uh, bodies in order to do research on it. And that's Dr. Lund's work. So there's an interesting concept, but we feel that the melatonin applied topically to the breast can make a tremendous, significant dent in that patient population. We were just talking to a patient, Dr. Patterson and I did together, who had breast cancer, and she was breezing through chemo. Would I, I guess, would we say breezing? Insanely breezy. Mm -hmm. People were stopping her, telling her how good her skin worked and how good she looked with losing her weight. You, you know, not, her, not losing her hair. <laughs> well, she did lose her hair, but but she was. They were raving about how good she looked, and they asked her what she was doing. She's, I'm doing chemotherapy, <laughs> and everybody laughs. I have breast cancer and metastasized. <clears throat> but because of the nutritional interventions and because we understood the therapeutic, and our company, which I'll name as ZPill, we deliver therapeutically effective research-based dosages to patients. That's what we do. And we do it in a way that bypasses first liver metabolism by and large, although I do make a few oral products. I've had actually people tell me that they didn't like it because they really went to sleep really quick. Mm. Or they had really wild dreams. Mm. That's one of the side effects of melatonin. And I, our product doesn't escape that. And I said, well, that's the good news. And they said, what's the good news? I said, well, at least you didn't buy something that didn't actually penetrate the skin. You just unfortunately can't take it. So we understand that there's going to be some mild side effects, but there's no demonstrable adverse effects associated with melatonin over the last 60 years of its utilization by anyone to the point where it's almost not even a drug. It's not even good for drug companies, and I'm not going to knock the pharmaceutical industry per se, but they do have economic interests, and most of their medications beget other medications, and they start to sequentially start to treat until before you know it, the elderly on 12 or 15 medications for all basically symptomatic responses to the adverse and adverse reactions of the medications they were taken to begin with.